Good evening. Good to uh, see everyone out this evening. Uh, first election will be noticed for hymn number 684. 684. This world is not my home. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. It treasures all laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I. That's one thing I know, my Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know He'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, and we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand. In victory, their song of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? From heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. <clears throat> Next lecture will be notes of hymn number 438. Hymn number 438. Tim will notice the uh, first, second, and fourth thing. First, second, and fourth. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Oh, when darkness fails his lovely days, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every hot and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Oh,
Beloved and most high Heavenly Father, we come to thee at this time, this afternoon, thanking thee for this beautiful day, thanking thee for the opportunity that each one of us has had to be out today, and thankful for the health that we enjoy, that we may be able to be out and hear portions of thy word and lift our voices in song, praise of thy high and holy name. We pray that as we go into this service, we do so with an open mind and receptive hearts to the things that are taught that we will keep our minds open and that we will take these things and use them in everyday lives that we may always strive to be better in thy sight and strive to be with thee in the after while. We're thankful for the elders we have at this congregation and thankful for their leadership. Pray that you will continue to bless them with good health and, and, and in their decision making that, that each one of us and, and that this church may continue to grow. And we're thankful for the deacons and the work that they do and pray that you will continue to bless each one of them. Pray that you will continue to be with Brother Sean and Brother Matt as they to preach to us the word of life that we may that they may do so with good consciousness and, and and that they may continue to present it in a way that each one of us may understand thy word better, that we may serve thee and do better reaching out to those round about us as we go throughout this life. Pray that you will continue to bless each one of us as we live here upon this earth, that you will watch over us, keep us safe in thy hand, and that we will always live to please thee and do that after a while that we may have a home in heaven with thee in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> Those that are like you would like to mark the hymn books, our song of invitation this evening will be hymn number 380. Hymn number 380 will be our song of invitation. And just before uh, Sean comes before us, we'll be noticing to hymn number 756. 756, uh, when we all get to heaven. We'll notice the uh, first, second, and fourth stanza. First, second, and fourth. Those that are light, that are able, to be stand. <clears throat> sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing in his mercy.
verses 22 through 25. Exodus 15, 22 through 25. So Moses, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of the Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Mar Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a, stat a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. You know, after being able to visit places like Zimbabwe and the Botswana, Africa, and Mexico, and even Dominica with Brother Charlie and Mike a few years ago, there is not a day that goes by where I'm not thankful to live in America. I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, I believe with all my heart that America is truly the greatest country in the world. We are truly a great, great country, and one of the reasons why we are so great is because here God has blessed us with a lot of prosperity. You see, as Americans, we are blessed to have an abundance of resources. We are blessed to have an abundance of food and water. Let me tell you something. For many countries in this world, in fact, for most countries in this world, they do not have that. They do not have the same level of food and clean water that we have in this country. God has provided us with so much here in America, but it is important that we understand that we are not the only ones in the history of the world to have experienced this abundance. You know, I'm also reminded of a great story that we find in our Old Testament, a story that I hope you're very familiar with, a story that we actually read in our Bible reading a few days ago. It is found right here in Exodus chapter 16. In Exodus chapter 16, the chapter after the chapter of Brother Will just read for us, it is important that we understand that by this time, in the context, some very important things have happened in the history of the nation of Israel. You see, by this time, the people of Israel, the Hebrew people, they have been freed from hundreds of years of Egyptian slavery. But by this time in the context, they have seen the ten plagues and the miraculous parting of the Red Sea. By this time, they've also seen God lead them out of Egypt by a pillar of cloud in the day and a pillar of fire at night. But by this time, Israel has seen all of these amazing wonders of God. And let me ask you, what would you have done if you were blessed to see the same things that these people were blessed to see? What would you have done if you were living in this time and you were blessed to see God miraculously part the Red Sea? What would you have done if you had seen God lead you by a pillar of cloud in the day and a pillar of fire at night? What would you have done if you had seen the ten plagues? What would you have done if you had seen all of these amazing things? Well, you know, when it came to the people of Israel, the Bible tells us exactly what they did in response. I want you to notice how in these verses, Brother Will just read for us from Exodus chapter 15. The Bible says that not long after God delivered them out of slavery and brought them safely across the Red Sea, they started doing something they were actually going to find them doing a lot. Even though God miraculously brought them across the Red Sea, not soon after that, they started grumbling. They started griping. They started complaining. Specifically on this occasion, if you notice, they're complaining for some drinkable water. Even though God just miraculously brought them across the Red Sea, they appeared to believe that God was going to let them suffer. They appeared to believe that God was not going to take care of them and provide for them as they made their way to the promised land. Even though God had already done so much for these people, all they did was grumble. 
All they did was complain. All they did was gripe against the Lord. That is what they're doing on this occasion. And unfortunately, this is not going to be the only time we find them doing this. I want you to go now to Exodus chapter 16. Go over one chapter to Exodus 16. And I want to read a few verses from Exodus 16 beginning with verse number 1. After God accommodates them, after God gives them the water that they requested. In Exodus 16 and verse 1, it says, Then they set out from Eliam, and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of sin, which is between Eliam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. Verse number 2, The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled, notice, grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them what we, that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of, of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. On the sixth day when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the sons of Israel, At evening you will know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumblings against the Lord. And what are we that you grumble against us? Drop down to verse number 12. In verse number 12, God says, I have heard the grumblings of the sons of Israel speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Notice how God says, you want bread, you want meat, I'm going to give it to you. God says, I'm going to give you a balanced diet. I'm going to give you some carbs, I'm going to give you some protein. God says, I'm going to give you meat, and I'm going to give you bread. And then in verse number 13, it says, So it came about at evening that the quails came up. There's your meat. And covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. Verse 14, when the layer of dew evaporated, behold, on the surface of the wilderness there was a fine flake-like thing, fine as the frost on the ground. When the sons of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is this? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Drop down to verse 31. And verse number 31, it says, The house of Israel named it, named this bread manna. And it was like coriander seed, white, and its taste was like wafers with honey. This was like some good stuff, some sweet good stuff. Verse 35, the sons of Israel ate the manna 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate the manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. I want to ask you to please let these verses soak in your heart for a few seconds. Brothers and sisters, what we find in these verses is absolutely amazing. It is absolutely incredible. This is one, in my opinion, of the greatest stories you're going to find in the Bible. This is truly a great story. And I want you to notice a few important observations to what we find here in this text. First, I want you to notice how like in the previous chapter when the people of Israel were thirsty for water. Here on this occasion, when they are hungry in the wilderness, God provides for them. God gives them what they need. He provides for his people when they are hungry. He gives them food, doesn't he? He gives them food. He gives them bread, even though they're grumbling. Even though they're complaining again, even though they're displaying absolutely no trust in him, notice he doesn't let them, he doesn't let them starve. He, he doesn't let them suffer. He doesn't let them die there in the wilderness. Instead, he provides for them. He feeds them. He gives them bread. He gives them manna, as the Bible says in verse number 31. The Bible says that God gives them manna. And in fact, notice where this manna came from. Going back to verse number 4 in the text, notice how the manna God gave them came from heaven. 
This was literally manna from heaven. This was literally manna that came from God himself. That is amazing. That is absolutely incredible. I mean, think about this. Think about it. These people are hungry in the wilderness. And God feeds them personally. God literally feeds them through a miracle from heaven. In fact, he does this for 40 years, for four decades, six days a week. The Israelites will wake up and go outside and guess what they would see? They would see manna all over the place. They would have food. All they would have to do is go outside and there it would be. They wouldn't have to go to the store and buy it. They wouldn't have to beg other people for it. They wouldn't have to go out and hunt for it and, ki or, and kill for it. No, all they had to do was wake up and go outside. There it is right there in their front yard. Every morning for four years, God will feed these people personally. Every morning for 40 years, they would wake up and experience a miracle. They would experience God giving them manna. For 40 years, they would literally taste and digest a miracle of God. God provided for these people. And let me say to you secondly that what God provides for them through this manna, it was more than enough. But by this we mean the bread that God gives them, it fully supplied their needs. As we would say today, this bread that God gave them, it got them full every single day. Every day when they went to bed at night, they didn't have to worry about going to bed hungry. Going back to the text, notice how in verse number 16, in verse 16, God told his people to gather as much as he should eat. He says, when you go do this, you gather as much as you should eat. In other words, God is saying to them, you get enough bread to get you full. Get enough bread to get you full on this day. God's providing for his people. And what he's providing for them is more than enough. But let me also say that there were some restrictions. There were some restrictions when it came to right? There were a couple of restrictions that God had for his people when it came to getting this bread. First, as you read this text a few days ago, Maybe you noticed how beginning with verse number 22, God told them that they were not to gather any bread on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day, which was the seventh day of the week, God said, that's going to be a day of rest for you. God said that on that day, I don't want you getting any bread. I don't want you going outside and picking up any bread. I don't want you doing anything on that day. That is a day of rest for you. You see, instead of gathering bread on that day, God told them to gather twice as much bread on the previous day, on the sixth day of the week. He said you get twice as much bread on the sixth day of the week, so on the seventh day you won't go hungry. But you can't gather on the Sabbath day. There's to be no gathering of bread on the seventh day of the week. And also notice how God says that when it comes to this bread, I don't want any leftovers. No doggy bags. Nothing in the cupboards. Cabinets, anything. God says, I don't want any leftovers. Going back to verse number 20, we see that any manna that wasn't eaten on the day it was collected, it would become worm food by the morning. In other words, it would be rotten. It would be no good. They couldn't eat it. The bread that God gave them from heaven was designed to fully supply their needs on the day it was collected. And that's certainly what he did. This bread supplied their daily needs, but not only did it supply their daily needs, I want us to also understand that this manna or this bread was also designed to teach Israel some very valuable lessons. To teach Israel some very valuable lessons about God and how they were to nurture their relationship with God. For example, one of the lessons that this manna was designed to teach Israel is number one, it was designed to teach them a lesson about trust. A lesson about trusting God. You see, as Israel gathered manna each morning for 40 years, God was trying to teach them something. God was trying to teach them to trust him. God was trying to teach them to fully depend on him, to fully rely on him for their daily needs. You see, if Israel was really going to make it to the promised land, 
If Israel really was going to defeat all these Canaanite enemies that were going to come before them, if they really were going to be successful on their way to the land of Canaan, then they had to learn to trust God. They had to learn to have confidence in God. They had to learn to trust in God's ability to provide for their needs. This manna was designed to teach them to trust God. It was designed to teach them a lesson about trust and also was designed to teach them a lesson about faith. Re remember, when it came to this manna, God didn't want any leftovers, did he? He didn't want any leftovers. He didn't want them being greedy. He didn't want them trying to store some food in the cabinet. He didn't want them trying to hoard any food. No, instead of storing food in the cabinet, God wanted them to go to bed every night having faith that when they woke up, that bread was going to be there. He wanted them to go to bed every night having faith that the same God who gave them bread on that day would also give them bread the next day. They had to go to bed having that kind of faith for 40 years. He's teaching them a lesson about faith. For 40 years, they had to have faith that when they woke up and went outside, that wilderness was going to be covered with bread. It taught them a lesson about faith. And it also taught them a lesson about gratitude. A lesson about gratitude that, unfortunately, they never really grasped. I want you to go back to Exodus chapter 16, okay? And I want you to notice something in Exodus chapter 16. As you read Exodus 16 a few days ago, I hope you noticed just how much the people of Israel grumbled against God just in that chapter. Did you notice that? For example, in verse number 2, as the chapter opens up, you know what we find Israel doing? We find them grumbling. They're grumbling. Specifically, they are grumbling on this occasion because they believe that God has tricked them and brought them out in the wilderness so they can die of starvation. They are grumbling in verse number 2, but then you go down to verse number 7, and you know what you find them doing? You find them grumbling some more. You go to verse number 8, you know what you find them doing? You find them grumbling some more. You go to verse 9, you know what you find them doing? They're grumbling some more, and then you go to verse 12, and guess what they're doing? They're grumbling some more. Even though God... Bless these people over and over again, even though God delivered them from slavery and brought them across the Red Sea, even though God gave them bread in the morning and meat in the evening, all they did was grumble. All they did was complain. All they did was gripe about how they felt what God was doing for them in that moment. It wasn't enough. These people griped. And they complained against God. In fact, Go over one chapter, look at chapter 17, verse 1. After God is going to give them bread through a miracle and meat. In Exodus 17 and verse 1, it says, Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Once again, they need water. Verse number two, therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? Verse three, but the people thirsted there for water and they, here it is again, grumbled against Moses and said, why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? My goodness. My goodness, brothers and sisters. Once again, once again, we find the people of Israel doing the main thing they seem to love to do. And that's grumble. That's complain. Even though God has fed them with a miracle in the morning, they are complaining. In fact, on this occasion, they're complaining for some water. They still don't trust God. They still don't have faith in God. They still don't believe. And God's ability to take care of them. God constantly blessed these people. God constantly did for, people, did for these people. And they hardly ever showed him any gratitude. This bread was designed to teach them a lesson about gratitude. And it also was designed to teach them a lesson about obedience. Exodus 16 and verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, behold I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. There it is. I say this bread was designed to teach them a lesson in obedience. It was designed to teach them to obey him. 
You see, as each day went by for 40 years, they would have to do what the Lord said. They would have to follow the instructions of God. They would have to gather exactly what God told them to gather, when he told them to gather it, and how he told them to gather it. They would have to do what God said if they were going to be sustained. This bread was designed to teach them some lessons in obedience. And then finally, I want to say this bread also was designed to teach them some lessons about love. Specifically, it was designed to teach them a lesson about how God really, really loved them. You see, each morning as Israel woke up and went outside, as they saw all that bread in the wilderness in their camp, they would be reminded of just how much God loved them. They would be reminded of just how much God cared for them, of just how much God was watching out for them all the time. You see, they ever began to have any questions about the love of God, all they had to do was wake up in the morning. In the morning, when they went outside, that manna would be there, and that manna they saw for 40 years would be a daily reminder of just how big God's love was for them. What I just want you to see is God provided for these people. For 40 years, he gave his people bread directly from heaven, and as we now transition and try to talk about some application for us today, I want to begin here by just suggesting to you that what God did for Israel 1,500 years or 3,500 years ago in the wilderness, he's also done for us today. Did you know that? You see, we need to understand that just like God did with the Israelites in the Old Testament, Today, even today, God has provided his people with bread. Today, God has provided his people with manna from heaven. And someone says, wait a minute, Sean, I don't agree with that. Someone says, wait a minute, when I woke up this morning and went outside, I didn't see any bread in my front yard. I didn't see any bread in my backyard. When I get my bread, I got to go to Walmart. I got to go to Kroger. I got to go to Publix to get my bread. I didn't get any bread from heaven, from God today? Well, my friend, I'm not talking about that kind of bread. I, I, I'm not talking about the bread you get in the store. I'm talking about a bread that's far greater than that. I, I'm talking about a, a bread or a manna that can do so much more for you than even the bread that Israel ate for 40 years in the wilderness. I'm talking about the bread that Jesus talks about in John chapter 6. Go on your Bibles, please, to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I want to begin reading with verse number 26 in just a moment. In John chapter 6, beginning with verse number 26, in the context here, if you recall, Jesus has just miraculously fed